So we have been going through the the time period in history, the, the 50s, kind of into the early 60s in this series. And it reminds me that there was... We as American Christians are very prone to self-protection. This time in history, but it's really not that unusual from other times in history, but specifically this time in history, you see a lot of Americans, even those who grew up kind of in a Christian environment, being very self-protective, being very concerned with protecting their own comforts and their own lifestyles and the way they felt their society should be, even to the point of justifying cruelty towards others that they felt were a threat to that. So looking at the prejudice and the segregation that was happening in the 1950s into the early 60s and beyond, so much of that stemmed from this idyllic American notion of this is how we want our society to be, this is where we want our comforts to be, all of this seems like a threat, therefore we're going to uh, fight against it with cruelty. And it's just, it's sad to see how self-protective we can become, how easily we can become self-protective, and how that can so easily translate into hurting others. And the reason that I wanted to highlight Lillian Trasher is because in the midst of a, a time period in American history when it was kind of this battle over per- self-protection and we're going to lash out at anything that, that threatens what we feel we want right now. There's an American woman who chose to live very, very differently. And her name was Lillian Trasher. She was pouring out her life right in this time period on the other side of the world for the destitute and vulnerable. I think we have a picture. Do we? Yeah. Kind of blurry picture. This is her when she's probably in about 1905 to 1910. But her entire life, I'm just going to summarize what she did, and then I'm going to unpack some spiritual truths that I have personally gleaned from her example. Her entire life was one of exchanging self-protection for sacrificial love. She was the first missionary to start a Christian orphanage in Egypt, and it quickly became the largest orphanage in Egypt. She started completely on her own, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that story, but she ended up personally caring for nearly 10,000 orphans and widows over the span of about 50 years as a missionary in Egypt. In 1955, the secular American press described her as the greatest American woman living outside the United States ranking high among the missionary heroines of her time. So even those who didn't really understand her motivation, her love for Christ, her poured out life, still called her the greatest American woman living outside the United States, which is pretty astounding. So during that nearly 50 years of work in Egypt, as as I said before, she cared for nearly 10,000 children, as well as the homeless and the blind, and she became known as the Nile Mother because she lived in Asut, Egypt, and it was near the Nile River. And I think it was Reader's Digest in the 50s that came and did a story on her and named her the Nile Mother. So that's how she became known that way. So in 1961, she died at the age of 74, and the doctor said her body simply gave out because of the burden of caring for so many orphans and widows. And yet when she died, she felt so honored and privileged and happy and joyful to have had the privilege of investing into the lives of so many precious children. I recently did a podcast for my Set Apart podcast on some of my historical mentors, and I highlighted some of the ways that this amazing woman has been an example to me. I really believe her story can inspire us today, even though it happened a long time ago. But the specific area that I want to challenge all of us to look at is exchanging our self-protective tendencies for a lifestyle of sacrificial love. Now, a lot of us probably wouldn't struggle with some of the same things that people struggled with in the 50s and 60s where we're wanting to, you know, lash out at at people that we feel are a threat to our personal comforts in that same way with violence and prejudice. But a lot of times we do get so caught up in the social dramas and the political dramas all around us to the point where we literally despise anyone out there who seems to be a threat to our liberties and the way we want our lifestyle to be. So maybe it would look like in a different package than what you see in the 50s and 60s, but that same spirit can creep in. A lot of us have self-protection more on a personal level where we don't want to step out of our comfort zone and we we become very indifferent to the needs around us and we live a very insulated life. And having traveled around to so many churches over the past 25 plus years, I feel like that is very common in the modern American church. It's a very insulated and comfortable lifestyle that does not ever want to step out of our comfort zone or get uncomfortable to serve others. 
The question that Lillian Trasher's life challenges me to ask is this. What if we as Christians begin to focus less on self-protection and more on sacrificial love? How would that change the modern church? And what kind of impact could we leave on the world today? Because so often we are so concerned with protecting our rights and pushing away those who seem to be infringing on those rights, but what if we shifted our focus to sacrificial love? It just makes me wonder how our world would change, how the church would change. So I would like to unpack some key moments and things from Lillian Trasher's life. Not that we're going to copy everything that she did specifically, but there are some spiritual principles that God worked in her life that she lived by. And these are principles that I've been challenged by personally. And I believe that we as believers can choose to embrace these principles today in such a time as this to exchange self-protection for sacrificial love. The first principle that I see in her life is choosing God's best over what we might think is the good for our lives. And this happened in 1905 when Lillian Trasher was 17. She was really wanting to start a career as a newspaper sketch artist. That was the desire of her heart. She was a talented illustrator. And it was in a time when that was kind of a big deal for a young woman to set out on her own and pursue a career. That wasn't normal in that time. But she was determined. She had this drive. She was going to start a career as a sketch artist. And she was on a train going to a job interview at a newspaper office. And she happened to sit next to a woman who ran an orphanage in North Carolina. And they started to talk. The woman asked if, if Lillian was a Christian, and she was. And she said, if you ever feel led, we always need help at, at the orphanage where I work. So if this newspaper job doesn't work out for you, you have an open door to come and serve at the orphanage. And she kind of just brushed it off like, okay, thanks, you know, but that's not where I'm headed. I know where I'm headed. I'm going to be, have this career. So she went to the newspaper. She made a very good first impression. They wanted to hire her immediately when they saw her sketches. But the man who had to finalize everything was out sick for a couple of days. So they said, come back in two days and we'll get everything finalized for this job. So she completely emotionally connected and gave her, her mindset, like, I'm going to have this job. And then he, she showed up two days later and they said, oh, I'm sorry, there's been a terrible mistake because the man who was supposed to hire you has been out sick. There was a miscommunication and we ended up hiring someone else for this job. And it was like this devastation, this disappointment, this completely closed door. And I don't know about you, but I've been in that position a few times in my life where you really feel strongly that you're headed in this direction, that this is where you're supposed to go, everything looks like it's lining up, and then the door just slams shut. And it feels like everything you're you're aiming for or investing in is just sort of crashing down around you. And so for her, she did what a lot of us would do, and she went back to her room, and she was crying. She was struggling. She was wrestling with God. And that went on for a while. She really had to get to the place where she laid down her own agenda. She laid down her own desires. And she said, okay, Lord, if this is not the path that you have for me, is this, if this is not the door you're opening for me, I surrender my life to you, not my will, but yours be done. I just put my life into your hands. And so she went back to the the newspaper, because the first time they hadn't uh, returned her sketchbook. So she went back there to gather her sketchbook, get, get her sketchbook for the, from them. And they apologized, and they said, we're so sorry. We would have wanted to hire you. It was just a misunderstanding. And she said, I'm completely at peace. I know that God has an amazing future for me. He has a plan for me. And from that point forward, she never looked back. She decided God had something even better. And she went to that orphanage in North Carolina to serve because that was the other opportunity she had in front of her. And that was where God really cultivated her passion to stand for the weak and the vulnerable. And it really was that closed door was what led to her starting the first Christian orphanage in Egypt and one of the largest orphanages in Egypt, that closed door led to her caring for about 10,000 children over her lifetime. So it's really amazing to me when we choose God's best, when we have that attitude that says, not my will, but yours be done, how God blesses and multiplies our surrender into eternal fruit. She often, she said that she often thought about how much joy and fulfillment 
that she would have missed if she had chosen to stubbornly cling to her own dreams of what she thought she needed and wanted in her life. So the key truth is this. We so often have our idea of how things need to unfold in our lives, and it's easy to settle for the good over the best. God's ways are always higher than our ways. I know that for me, when I look back at the closed doors in my own life and how disappointed I felt when something that I really wanted to happen didn't happen, in every case, looking back, I discovered God had something better, and it was better than my idea of the good. It was God's best. I, I see how God protected me from making wrong decisions so that she, he could direct me into his best for my life. He really does work all things together for good to those who love him, to those who put their trust in him. But we have to trust him completely in order for that miracle to happen in our lives. Amy Carmichael had a lot of closed doors in her ministry, and when she fell later in her life and was crippled for the last 20 years of her life, one of the statements that she made was this, in acceptance lies peace. Instead of fighting against her circumstances and saying, God, how could you allow this to happen? I was headed this direction. Now you redirected me here. She said, I'm going to accept this as God's best for me, and that's where peace is going to come from. And from that place of being confined to her room for those 20 years, she wrote most of the books that have changed my life and the lives of so many others. Those I look up to in Christian history seem to have that as a common thread. They were able to accomplish amazing things for God, but in every case, God had to first walk them through a season where they learned how to declare within their soul and with their lives, not my will, but yours be done. <coughs> the second principle that I want to highlight in Lillian Trasher's life is the principle of saying yes at any cost. And when we talk about sacrificial love, that's really what it boils down to. That predecided yes, even at the expense of our own comforts and our own self-protection. When Lillian Trasher was in her 20s, she was still working at the orphanage in North Carolina, and she met an amazing godly man named Tom. He was a young minister, and he had a growing church, and they fell in love. They became engaged, and they had kind of their whole future planned, and it was, it was good, but it wasn't God's best for her. And two and a half weeks before their wedding, she went to hear a missionary speak, and he was talking about the needs around the world of the destitute, of the vulnerable, the needs of, of places in the world where the gospel hadn't come yet. And she knew at that moment that this is what she was called to, not a settled, comfortable life with Tom leading a church here in the States, but a life poured out on the mission field as a single woman. And this is two and a half weeks before her engagement. So through a lot of surrender and a lot of tears, she made the decision, and this is what she said to one of her best friends, God has called me to pour out my life on some foreign mission field, and I can't refuse him, not even for Tom. So she broke the engagement, and she, through a series of events, felt that she was supposed to go to Egypt. It was completely on faith because she did not have a mission board backing her up or a church that was sending her, and she didn't even really have enough money to get over there. It reminded me a lot of Gladys Aylward's story, who knew she was called to China but didn't even really have clarity on how she was getting to China or how she would afford to live there. But she had this one little thin thread, this letter from an older missionary who needed someone to come, and she just said, I'm going there. That's how Lillian Trasher started. She met a group of missionaries who were working in Egypt, and they said, well, we can't support you, but if you want to come, we'll at least give you a place to live and help you get established there. So her journey to get to Egypt was one completely on faith. She would have enough money for one leg of the journey, and then she would have to wait in that city until God miraculously provided more for her to get the next step of the journey until she finally got there. And you know, you think about the fact that here's someone who's given up so much to say, Lord, I'm willing to serve you on the mission field. Why would God not just fund the whole thing right at once? You know, just I'm backing you up. I'm supporting you. Just go. You have all the money that you need. You can just sail from here to here with no problems. But when you look at the, the rest of her life, you realize that her journey over to Egypt and having to trust God by faith for every step of the way was actually preparation for when she would be responsible for hundreds or thousands of orphans and widows and have to tr trust God for their every need to be met. It was all part of the story that God was writing for her. So saying yes at any cost, she ended up in Egypt living with this group of missionaries, starting to learn the language, starting to get established, and she still didn't have 
a lot of money or support, but she at least had security and a place to live. It was a dangerous city where she was. So going out on her own as a single woman wasn't really very safe. But one night, there was an Egyptian, young Egyptian mother who was dying and asked Lillian to take her dying baby. And that was sort of like her final words, right? As she slipped uh, away and died, she gave her baby to Lillian. And this baby was sickly, was like a skeleton, didn't even really look human because it was so sickly. And she took this baby in and tried to begin to nurse it back to health. And the missionaries that were in the home that she was living in didn't support this. They said, you really shouldn't have an Egyptian baby here that your came this this child needs to go back to her own family but she knew Lillian knew the details of this family and she knew the child was would likely die or be killed if she went back to the family so they said you have to make a choice you either give the baby back to the family where it came from or we're kicking you out of this mission home and you know it may sound kind of harsh and cruel but they had their established ministry and they had their way of doing things and they didn't have a lot of flexibility beyond that and having the baby there was keeping everybody awake at night because the baby was crying. It was causing all sorts of problems. So she said, I'm taking the baby and I'm leaving. And she went into a suit and rented a house and used the rest of her money to buy a few pieces of furniture and a little bit of milk for this baby. And that was how the first orphanage began. She didn't know where the rent money would come from next month. She didn't know where the food would come from to sustain her. Her sister actually joined her there. So they had this house, this sickly child, and just the two of them with no money. And that was how everything started. But again, that was saying yes at any cost. She could have stayed where it was comfortable and secure. But she said, I'm stepping out to care for this one child because I know this child is precious in the sight of God. Within a few months, God began to miraculously provide through little bits of money or gifts of food that would be left on their doorstep. And the first few children, once people heard that she was willing to care for children in need, the first few additional orphan children showed up on her doorstep, and she took them in, no questions asked. And one of the first things that happened to her right when her orphanage was getting off the ground, I think she had about four children, is she contracted bubonic plague because one of the boys that she had taken in got bubonic plague like the day after he came. So she was like hanging between life and death for several weeks. And when she finally recovered, she had a very weakened heart. She was in a weakened state physically. And yet she joyfully accepted that as a way of loving sacrificially. When that little boy was diagnosed with bubonic plague and taken away, she went, she, it was before she started showing symptoms, she bent down to give him a hug so that he would know he was loved. She, didn't, she was not self-protective. Even if I get the bubonic plague, I'm going to show love to this little boy. And she did get the bubonic plague. But God spared her life and the life of this little child. Those are just a few examples of saying yes at any cost. But her entire life was a testimony of pouring out day and night for the vulnerable that God brought to her. Her body was always tired. She was always kind of in a state of health concerns because of the strain and the burden that she carried for these children. Because after a few years, it went from three or four children to 100 children. And after a few years, then it went to 300 children. And it got to the point where she had about between seven and 900 children in the orphanage at any one given time. She started out in a little house, but then God provided land, God provided buildings, God continued to bring people. And every single time, she didn't really have, every single season, she didn't really have money from one day to the next. So very much like George Mueller, they would, they would pray before every meal and God would bring miraculously, bring them what they needed. Her life seems to declare, along with Paul in Philippians 2.17, even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice. We live in a very self-protective culture, even a very self-protective Christian culture. And so this kind of concept that Paul is talking about here, I am maybe being poured out like a drink offering on behalf of you, the church, those I am discipling and shepherding, but I am glad and rejoice. He doesn't say, woe is me. This is so hard. I'm being poured out for you. He says, I am glad and rejoice. That is the perspective of saying yes at any cost, of choosing sacrificial love over our self-protection. One story I think is really interesting from Lillian Trasher's life, later in her life when she had hundreds of children under her care, she would never, she never spent anything on herself. She always gave everything that she had to the children. And she traveled only a few times away from Egypt to back to the United States to gain prayer support or to bring awareness, raise money for the orphanage. And she went to stay with, she was part of the Assemblies of God Church, and she went to stay with a family, or a 
host family in the Assemblies of God, and they put her in a, a hotel, like a, just a normal hotel. And whenever she would travel, she only had like a one suitcase that was only half full. It, they said that she had one change of clothes, a Bible, a notebook, and a pen, and the, that was all that she owned in that suitcase. And everything else went to the children. They put her in this hotel, and she read on the back of the door that the hotel was costing $18 a night. And she was horrified. She thought, what could $18 a night do for the children at the orphanage? What if we translate that money into milk for the babies and all these things? So she called the people that had put her there in the middle of the night, and she said, I'm not sleeping here. I can't spend this kind of money on me when I know it could go to help these children. And so they never made the mistake of, they said, well, we want you to be comfortable. And she said, I am comfortable almost anywhere, but not in the lap of luxury. To her, an $18 a night hotel was the lap of luxury. So she constantly said yes at the expense of her own comforts. Another principle that I gleaned from her life was choosing childlike faith. <clears throat> One thing that I have seen in my own life in different seasons, in, in just a much smaller scale than Lillian Trasher, is that when we take steps of obedience, especially when we choose to get out of our comfort zone, when we choose to love sacrificially, and especially when we choose to stand for the weak and the vulnerable, God always backs us up with his miracles. The times I have most seen the miracles of God in my life are those the times when I have made a decision to say yes to the vulnerable. So I think through our adoption stories, they're all incredibly miraculous because we said yes. And that's a very, very small scale compared to what Lillian Trasher was doing. But that's how we see the miracles of God. We get in step with what God is doing, and we say, yes, Lord, I am willing to step into this calling, even though it's scary, and I trust you with a childlike faith. This is something Lillian Trasher wrote in 1955 after 45 years of caring for orphans, basically living on faith the whole time. She said, The orphanage is a testimony of love and faithfulness of God. Every day we live over again the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. For 45 years I've never turned away a child I felt should be in the orphanage. Oh, it's wonderful to trust God and to trust Him for the care of all these children. If only you could see the miraculous change that comes into their broken lives when they contact Christians. Christian love. I'd rather do this work than anything else in all the world, taking care of the babies of Egypt. There are a lot of moments when she understood childlike faith and the power of just total dependency on God. There were times very, very similar to George Mueller where she would gather 700 children around an empty table. There were no leftovers in the orphanage and no money in the orphanage, and they would thank God for this amazing meal that was about to come that he was going to provide. And within minutes of them ending their prayer, somebody would pull up in front of the orphanage door with a donation of food for them to eat. There were times when she would go out into the countryside or go out and try to raise money for the, the needs to be met of the children. And finally, she got to the point where she said, Lord, I can't go out and raise money and also care for these children, so I'm going to completely trust you. You be the fundraiser. I'll care for the children. And every single time, God did that. There was a time when there was a lot of rebellion and fighting in the in the country of Egypt, and she went through a really incredible experience where the entire town of Asut, every every building, every farm was completely destroyed. It was burned to the ground by rebels, and the only building that was not touched was her orphanage. She, in the middle of the night, took 107 children to, it, they, under the cover of darkness, they ran to a brick kiln, which was abandoned for safety to, to get away from the bullets and the fires and everything. But when they got back the next morning, their, their building was the only one untouched. And the rebels came the next day to, to kill her because she was a foreigner. It was a rebellion against foreign people, especially. And one of the local farmers who his, his farm had been burned to the ground, he came and he stood between these rebels who were about to kill her and himself. And he put himself in between and he said, you, you're not from here. You don't know. She's taken in our helpless children. She's cared for our orphans and widows. She doesn't deserve to die. You'll have to get through me first if you're going to kill her. And he saved her life. And that was in the face of him losing everything. That's how much of an impact she made on that community. But she had to constantly live in childlike faith and dependence upon God. And, you know, we can so easily romanticize someone who did great things for God and who made a, an amazing impact and impacted all these orphan children. And I've known a lot of Christians who want to set out for some big adventure for the glory of God, but don't recognize the sacrifice, the tears, the childlike 
childlike faith, the wrestling, the dependency that is needed all along the way. It's not just some big, romantic, exciting adventure. It is an exciting adventure with God. But there are a lot of tears and a lot of trusting and a lot of wrestling that go with that package. The fourth principle I see in her life is understanding the power of prayer. When we choose sacrificial love over self-protection, God always backs us up. During the Second World War, Lillian's orphanage was brought to the place where she thought she might have to send the children away into homes. She didn't know if she could continue to care for them. They had 900 children at that point and over 100 widows. And because of the war, because the channels of normal donation flows and supplies coming into the country were closed because of the war, nothing could really get to them. And even the cost of things like food and clothing had gone so so high in the country that the little money that she had couldn't stretch very far. And so by 1941, the children's clothes were in tatters and they were down to eating one half cup of lentils a day. They were on the brink of starvation and they couldn't receive any outside help. There didn't see, it seemed like a very impossible situation. She closed all activities, closed the school and said, we're going to cry out to God day or night. And so all of the children and all of the widows and she herself, they got on their face before God and they just began to pray and said, Lord, you're our only hope. If you don't send us some sort of an answer, we are all going to starve to death. That's the place they had come to. Now, I know what it's like to be challenged financially, trying to make a small amount of money stretch, you know, for a a long time for a bigger family. I know what it's like to be in tense situations as a mother. I've been in the hospital room when one of my children's going through surgery and just, you know, praying the whole time. I know what it's like to be in the midst of a really stressful adoption process and having to trust God for that to actually happen. I know I know about a lot of trials when it comes to being a mother, but I don't really know what it's like to have a thousand people, widows and orphans, under my care and to feel like they're all on the brink of starvation and to not see any answer in sight. So just imagine the strain and the burden. And she really had to believe in God's faithfulness. She really had to know that her prayers were going to be answered. So they, they cried out to God all day and all night, right as they were about to starve to death. And the next morning, they received a telegram from the American ambassador wanting her to come and meet him. She had no idea why, but she went to meet with him, and she found out that there had been an American Red Cross ship, and it was carrying a ton of relief supplies. It came near Greece, and then the word came that Greece had fallen, and it was too dangerous for them to land that ship, and so they were ordered back to Alexandria to await further orders. Then it was feared that the ships in Alexandria Harbor were going to be attacked, so they were ordered to dump out their cargo, all of those relief supplies, into the sea and head out to sea under the cover of darkness just to save the ship and save the sailors. There was a young Scottish sailor aboard that ship who knew about Lillian's orphanage, and he pleaded with the captain of the ship to unload the cargo instead of dumping it in the sea. He told the captain about the orphanage, and he had given money to them before he had prayed for them. His mother had prayed for their orphanage. And so the captain didn't really want to do that because it was more trouble to unload the cargo versus just dump it out into the ocean. But the sailor wouldn't back down. He said, I know a group of people who could use these supplies. So they quickly and hurriedly unloaded the cargo, and the ship went back out to sea before they could be attacked. And then somehow the supplies were taken to a warehouse and told that it was for Lillian's orphanage. So the ambassador asked her, do you have any need of food and supplies at this time? And she (laughs) just started to cry, yes, we do. And she went to Alexandria with him to see the warehouse where the cargo was, and the abundance of the provision overwhelmed her. It's like the fishes and the loaves, God doing exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. So just a list of what was in that uh, ship, 2,600 dresses, 1,900 sweaters, 1,900 boys' pants, 3,800 blankets, 1,100 towels, 1,200 sacks of rice, just so much food, so many clothes, so many supplies and clothing. And it was just, it was beyond what she could even wrap her mind around. She just sank to her knees and cried with gratitude. God answers prayer. And she began to see that in a very, very powerful way. And she'd seen it all throughout her ministry life. But that story was probably the most dramatic. And all of the food that they got from that ship and all of the clothing and supplies sustained them through the rest of the war. 
There was another time when there was a cholera outbreak in Egypt, and everybody was being quarantined to their houses and having to put these signs up on their houses like, don't come near, we have cholera, people were dying. It was really bad because people would get would be fine in the morning and be dead by evening. It was like that quick. And so you really couldn't take any chances of being exposed. And here she had a thousand people in an orphanage in very close quarters. So if one person with cholera came into the orphanage, they could all be exposed and a lot of them could die. And yet she had never refused a child in need. And one day this man showed up with his two small boys. They were in rags. They had no food, no th- nowhere to go. She, he asked if, he, if, they, if she would take these two little boys. And at first she said no, because she thought, I can't bring in two children that had been out there where the cholera is and risk the fact that they could expose all these children. And it was the first time she had ever turned anybody away. And then she went back to her room and she just felt so convicted, like, this is, I am putting boundaries around what God can do. I, I'm, I'm thinking of this as wisdom, but actually I'm saying no to someone in need and I, I can't live that way. So she went back out to find the man with the two little boys and said, I want you to come. I want you to come into the orphanage. We're going to take you in. And she started to regret that decision later that night when one of the little boys started running a high fever and showing signs of cholera. And he had been mixing with all of the children and they took him to the hospital where they diagnosed him with cholera and he died a few hours later. So this is just the same day that she invited them in and she was, she went to her room and just began weeping because she knew that once one person in the orphanage would get that and start to die, die from it, then everybody would start to die. So she, she went to Psalm 91 and she said, okay, Lord, you, you're promising your supernatural protection for those who trust you here. And I'm going to take Psalm 91 as a promise over this entire ministry. So she has over a thousand children, over a thousand orphans and widows. They've just been introduced, cholera has just been introduced. They're all in very close quarters. It's not like they can sanitize and quarantine and isolate or do anything like that. But not one single person, just totally against the odds, not one single person in her ministry came down with the disease. And that's that was completely miraculous. That was, again, the power of prayer. One thing that I'm reminded of as I hear these stories, read these stories, is that we serve the same God as Lillian Trasher. We need to learn how to make him our first turn, even when we face those kinds of impossible situations, because we serve the God of the impossible. Those that I most look up to in history seem to have accomplished amazing things for the glory of God effortlessly, but we have to remember they didn't just wake up one day and decide to do something notable for the glory of God. There were so many hard moments of facing the impossible, of having to get on their knees and cry out to God who was their only hope. One thing I want to encourage you with with this principle is remember that God is still writing your story. So all of the challenges and soul wrestlings and impossible circumstances that you might be facing, he's actually using those to write an epic story that will impact the world for his glory when we refuse to let go of him. And that is what we see in Lillian's life. Another principle is that she embraced small beginnings. I did an episode earlier in this series called The Day of Small Beginnings or Small Beginnings. But it's basically the principle of knowing that God often will start with one small step of obedience and bless that into something that will multiply for his glory when we are faithful with the little that he entrusts us with. And so she started most of her building projects, including her very first orphanage, started with what she called the three brick rule. If she had three bricks to stack on top of each other, they would stack them on top of each other and say, this is the start of a building that we know God is going to supply for. And slowly the rest of the bricks would come in and they would continue to add to the building, add to the bricks until the building was done. And that was her three brick rule. She said this in the, the, the 50s when she was interviewed about her ministry. She, was, she said this, once you know it's God's will, get moving. At the orphanage, we start a new building project as soon as we have three bricks to put on top of each other. So I love that. Instead of thinking, well, we're not going to do anything here. We only have three bricks. Like that's not going to multiply into anything. Hey, we have three bricks. Let's put them on top of each other and pray and stand in faith. And we're not going to despise the day of small beginnings because we know God often starts with small beginnings for his most amazing stories. Number six principle is leaving a spiritual legacy by staying the course. 
It is really, really easy to grow weary in well-doing. And I can say that from personal experience in over 25 years of ministry. There are a lot of moments, you know, when we read stories of, of Christians that did these great things, we, we see the end of the story, the triumph, the summary of their life's work. But we don't often see the moments when they were tempted to just walk away in defeat, when they felt like giving up, when they wanted to just go back to where it was comfortable. And there are a lot of moments like that along the way. Leaving a spiritual legacy is not something that most Christians set out to do. They don't say, I'm going to do something big and grand and notable and notorious. That, that is something that happens when we live surrendered lives. God is the one who does something powerful through our lives when we surrender to him. So here's how she summarized her life's work, her legacy. For these 45 years, I have tried to live in such a way as to pass something tangible on to a new generation. I would like to pass on a disposition of Christian character. I live before these orphans every day in the way that I want them to live in their homes in the land of Egypt. I try to show them how to smile even in the shadows. Every hour of the day and night, I do my best to live before them the life I want them to live before their fellow men. I try to transmit to them a life to know that if they can trust God, everything will be all right. I do my best to teach them to have faith in God so that they will be able to face life with a heart of trust. I try to pass on to them a power, a power of prayer, power with fellow men that they may teach others how to find the true way. That is such a beautiful example. Her legacy came from all of those moments of choosing sacrificial love over self-protection, of choosing to trust God even in the faith, face of the impossible. And living that out is an example. A lot of the children who grew up in her orphanage actually went on to become leaders of other orphanages or ministers, people who started their own churches and Christian organizations all around that area, that region, and that country. So her, her work was multiplied. When she was in her 70s, she had a lot of health problems. She was carrying, she, she continued to carry the strain of this, of this work. And someone asked her in her early 70s, do you ever get tired in your work? And her response was, goodness, no. My babies are not orphans to me. They are the dearest things I have in life. I pray for them and dream of them. When a ragged, dirty child is brought to me, I try to picture how he will look in eight or 10 years if we do not take him in and what he will be if we refuse him. That is why I dare not refuse children. I thank God that we have never had to refuse anyone who really needed us. I have never been as happy as I am now in the work that God has given me to do. I would not exchange what I have done or am doing for all the wealth of America. This is life to help those who need you and those who have no one else but you. And then a news reporter asked her about a year before she died, what is the secret of your missionary success? What is the greatest thing you ever did? So you think about a woman who's cared for nearly 10,000 children, seen them through the, the ups and downs of war and rebellion in the country and seen miraculous provision. She's ed educated these children. A lot of the, the education that she gave them were textbooks that she personally wrote. And then they went on to become spiritual leaders in their country. I and mean, that's a lot of good stuff that she did. But here's what she said she did as the greatest thing. There isn't any secret. I just stayed. I did not quit. I stayed with the work God gave me to do. That was her response. Her, the greatest thing she ever did was not to grow weary in doing good, to not walk away from the calling on her life, even though it was hard, to not choose self-protection versus self sacrificial love, to stay with the work that God gave her to do, to stay the course. That is how she left such an amazing legacy. And I see today so many Christians who get weary. You know, we start out with enthusiasm and, you know, we have all these visions and dreams and desires of doing these great things for God. And then things get difficult. Things get hard. We face persecution or impossible circumstances or disappointment or heartache. And we want to walk away. And a lot of us do walk away. But think about what God can do through our lives when we stay and when we trust him and when we are faithful. So in summary, the power of sacrificial love is what I want to highlight here. The culture gives us a message, and even the church gives us this message at times. Don't give too much to others. Protect your own rights. Don't lose your sense of self or forget about your own dreams just because you're trying to please others. This is one I hear a lot as a mom. You know, don't give too much to your family. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. 
If you always try to please others, you'll become exhausted and like an overworked martyr. There are books written about this, especially to women, Christian women today. Now, it's definitely true that we need to be obedient to God and not just try to impress others with our good works and our sacrificial life that we came up with. Like, this is how I'm going to show that I'm, you know, living a Christian sacrificial life. But there is tremendous joy that we can find in sacrificial love that is out of obedience to God. There is such incredible fulfillment and joy in life in loving others sacrificially the way Christ loved us. I believe that when we shift from asking the question, what can I get to what can I give, everything changes. An outward focus is what God can use to change the world. When you look at the example of Christ and when you study what the Bible has to say about loving others sacrificially, you begin to realize that serving other people, pouring your life out for others is not actually what leads to exhaustion and burnout, as our culture would lead us to believe. Burnout comes from serving. If you're, if you're going to get burnout in serving others and loving others, it comes from doing good things for the wrong reasons and in the wrong spirit. If you are doing it in your own strength and, or if you're doing it for your own you know, brownie points in heaven or brownie points with this world, that will lead to exhaustion and burnout. When we fail to take time to sit at the feet of Jesus, then we start rushing around like Martha doing good things in our own strength and becoming more stressed out and more exhausted at every moment. But when we yield our lives completely to him, when we say, Lord, work through me. I am your vessel. That's when we experience his enabling grace. He gives us the strength to do what we could never do on our own. One woman going to Egypt as a single woman with no support and caring for over nearly 10,000 orphans and widows is not something a human can do in their own strength. It requires the supernatural enabling grace of God. And it starts with our willingness to say, Lord, My life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. So let's not be afraid to step out of our comfort zones and love sacrificially, even in our own homes and families. Here are a few verses about this. Romans 15, 2 and 3. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification, for even Christ did not please himself. Now the phrase please his neighbor in this verse means to strive to please, to accommodate oneself to the opinions, desires, and interests of others. That's very sacrificial, and that's not the way our culture teaches us to live, but here it is in God's pattern. And in Philippians 2.4, Paul says, Let each of you not look out only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. Again, just imagine taking that approach into our daily life and our culture. How would things change? Not constantly demanding that our needs be met, but joyfully pouring our lives out for those that he puts in our path to love and to serve. Sacrificial love may at first seem like a fast track to exhaustion, and it actually may take a toll on us physically, as it did on Lillian Trasher. But when we serve to the Lord, unto the Lord, as to him and not to men, when we lean on the amazing strength of Christ, it can actually become one of the most fulfilling and engaging and energizing things we could ever do. In fact, if you look at everything she wrote and and watch some interviews with her at the end of her life, she was so fulfilled and so joyful and so privileged, and she didn't regret everything that it cost her to take care of these children. We do have times when God asks us to come away and be refreshed and refueled. It doesn't mean we should never take time to rest. But let's never buy the cultural lie that we should put limits around loving and serving others or pouring out our lives for others out of self-protection. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. Now that's not a selfish or convenient love. That is a love without limits. It's the way that he loved us, and it's the way that he calls us to love others. So whatever that means for our lives today, we're not all called to go overseas and start a a Christian orphanage, but we are called to step out in sacrificial love, to pour our lives out for those that he puts in our path without that bubble of self-protection around us. That is when we really will begin to see the church make an impact on this world. So by his grace, let's choose to exchange self-protection for sacrificial love, and let's watch what God will do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these examples of men and women that have gone before us who have chosen complete availability to you. 
at the expense of their own comforts and self-protection. And I ask that you would work this truth more deeply in each of us, wherever we are at, whatever season of life we are at. It looks different for each of us, and some of us, it's right within our own homes that we need to embrace this principle. But Lord, I ask that you would make this real to us and that we would not be known as Christians in such a time as this who just fight for our own rights and our own self-protection, but we would be known as Christians who love as you loved. In Jesus' name, amen.